when I went to these wards, I didn't understand how much they would change me. And even when I was there, I didn't understand to what extent they did change me. So when I came back, I remember my wife saying to me that when I went to bed with her, she felt like she was going to bed with a stranger. Is that automatically when you witness killing, death, the savage side of human nature that starts to eat away at you, it starts to affect you, and you become hardened. I arrived in October 91 when Ukraine was still the Soviet Socialist Republic, and I tried to come to Russia, in fact, but wasn't able to get the visa. I came with 60 rolls of film, a couple of cameras, and not much belief that this would probably last more than a few months. And little by little, even though I wasn't really paid very much, I started to find work, and I've now been working for the New York Times for 20 years. I mean, I've always worked for other publications too. Uh, over the years, I've worked a lot for, for Time Magazine, for Newsweek. I remember very clearly the first time I had a big photograph published in a major publication. It was a story about Crimean Tatars returning to their homeland. And I went down on, the, on a plane to Simferopol, the capital, and at that time it was in 1992, 1991. They were building these tiny huts of stone on the outskirts of the city. And I remember photographing this woman whose entire possessions were on the outside, not on the inside. In the inside of her house, there was only room for a bed. So on the outside, there were trays and tables and, and cooking utensils, and there was cabbages. And she was this great big bear woman, and she had a big blue dress. And I remember taking a photograph, and she had her hand crossed over her chest, her palm on her heart, either like Napoleon or Nelson, I can remember which. The best land pictures are, for me, the pictures which I feel most proud of and they're also the pictures which I had the most difficulty with. I went to the morgue in Bloody Kavkaz and found it literally, not only was the inside full, but the whole courtyard was completely filled with corpses. And some of them were in black bags and obviously they were in very bad shape and some of them were in these, under these, these light plastic bags almost seemed untouched, they looked like they were simply sleeping. And one of these was uh, this young boy, and he had a tooth missing. And I remember looking at that boy like I was looking at one of my own children. And it's like one of these moments when you're looking at a scene and you know that it's real, but you don't want to believe that it's the case. And I took his picture. And then your your own your own emotions are playing are playing a battle, and that picture is really a, a photograph which I have a lot of difficulty knowing that I took. It's something which you know it it it's a, you're a conduit for something which is really very very difficult to digest. I went back two weeks later when term time officially restarted, as if as if Best Land was going to restart its life. Except, of course, it was very clear that the emotional scars of the city were far too great for anybody to restart anything. And I remember when they restarted the school, all the children who'd been at school number one, they were transferred to school number six, and that's where I was. And I remember going there and seeing these women in these empty corridors, because only a very few children turned up, of course. And you could, you could hear screams. Literally, when I walked down, you could hear the screams. That something was... was or somebody was talking to you, screaming at you, you couldn't see anything, but it was there. And one of the pictures there is this, this, is this picture of a chair with hundreds of cigarettes which just been left to burn, and that was left in a mark of respect to the, the male relatives who were taken by the terrorists and executed and thrown out the window. The local men came and just left a cigarette to burn as a mark of respect for their sacrifice. I think that uh, Russia is a, is a wonderful place to be a photographer. I think that the Russians in general are very open to being photographed. 
I think in general they're much more open to being photographed than say in France or in England. And they like to pose a little bit. They don't feel uncomfortable in front of the camera. And I never feel that it's not interesting. So it's never, it never feels dull to me. I think the Russians also are people who naturally wear their emotions on the outside. Clichés are something which every photographer falls in love with. When you think of Russia, for instance, you think of the Golden Domes, you think of the long-legged women, and they think, you know, these slightly crazy people. And the walruses, I suppose, panders to that impression. Yet, within all these clichés, of course, there is a certain grain of truth. And then there was this woman who swam this perfect breaststroke, six lengths, and it was it was so smooth and gilded that when she was swimming, the snow that was falling at the time nestled perfectly in her hair. And then when she steps out of the pool, there's this extraordinary look on her face of serenity. And even though it's minus five and it's Moscow and she's surrounded by ice and snow, she looks like she's stepping out of a pool in the south of France. And this tells me something about Russia. I mean, supposedly Winston Churchill said that one can never invade, successfully invade a country which likes to eat ice cream in the winter. Of course, like all Western male photographers, I have spent probably too much time photographing Russian girls. Uh, but, you know, I guess going back to the, the part of the cliché, part of the vision which, in a way, people expect to see of Russia, but which also is, is part of the reality. And um, I spent five years living in, in Rome and I would go to these, these cocktail parties and invariably I'd be asked as someone who lived in Russia if it was true. And I'd say, like, it's what true? And they go, the girls. And I go, yeah, it's, it's true. And there's several photographs I have in this book. One of is of this girl walking along this deserted road in the middle of Lipetsk region. I stop the car when I see her and I just wait for her to walk on past and the only sounds are the, the wheat swaying in the light wind and the, the click of her heels on the broken tarmac of this rural road. Going to war and then coming back, these are two equally difficult journeys. And the stories in this book are also an examination of that journey about how you switch between one emotional state and another and also whether the fact that it's really not so easy to go from one place to the other. You physically even get on a plane and, like, and you go to a war. But the physical transition and the emotional transitions happen at very different speeds and in very different ways.